Hello and welcome back to Fast Keto. Today's episode is with a recurring guest, Dr. Angela Stanton. She is an expert on electrolytes and this episode is all about electrolytes, water retention, edema, and protein. And I had her on the show previously, so if you missed that episode, be sure to go check it out because it may answer questions uh, that are missed on this one. And this one's kind of like almost like a part two where we got to dig into gluconeogenesis, a lot more and into carnivore, OMAD, water retention and fasting um, and why that can happen and how to kind of tweak and fix your electrolytes based on that. So I know you guys are going to enjoy this episode featuring Dr. Angela Standen. Welcome back to Fast Keto. It's so nice to have you here again on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me back. It's awesome. I, I mean, last time we podcasted, I, I could, you know, could have gone on for hours chatting with you, but we had so many questions too after like you saw on YouTube. Um, it seems like, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about protein today, uh, but also electrolytes. That's really your area right. of expertise. Uh, but it seems like there are endless questions about electrolytes and, um, you know, just with keto and low carb, it seems to be one of the main topics, what are, just to start off with, what are some of the big mistakes that you see people making um, when it comes to electrolytes, supplementing, not supplementing? What are some of those things that you're like, from all the research and knowledge you have that you see people doing? I, specifically in the carnivore space or keto or in keto, general? carnivore, low carb, like, yeah. They're that. different. They're actually quite different. So <laughs> let me start with carnivores since um, uh, your clientele, it seems, or, or the audience seems to be a lot more carnivore than other groups. And it's both. It's really keto and carnivore. Keto and carnivore. So I had a couple of people join my migraine group, uh, even though they're not necessarily migraineurs, after the first interview that, that we had uh, as a result of uh, the edema that we discussed then. So just to re recap that we discussed, a lot of people can't, on the carnivore diet specifically, but perhaps even on keto diet, they, they can't consume a lot of salt and water without getting edema. Yes. And um, it, some of these people joined the group and, and once they joined the group, we found out, well, what is it that they do different from other people? Because if you're on a standard, um, what I call the protocol in a migraine group, uh, and you don't have to be migraine to be in the group. So we have a lot of people who have other issues. Um, but if you're in a standard protocol or my kind of carnivore, or my kind of keto, and we'll have to define what those are, you don't have any hydration issues and you don't get edema from drinking uh, water uh, that is salted. So there was something vastly different from uh, what we do with respect to people who just joined us and who were listening to the previous video. And uh, what I found out is that, first of all, how often you eat your meal and the kind of meal is important. So the bolus amount of what you consume and how often you drink your water, what kind of water and, and how you position the salt in there. And so what I found was is that um, the people so far at least who have joined, uh, they were all eating OMAD style, which is a one meal a day, which is a problem both for the protein as well as for the hydration. And they were also drinking OMAD style. I mean, most of them are drinking up a whole lot of water and trying to salt at once or maybe three times a day. There was a person I think drank so much in the morning and so much in the afternoon and then nothing in between. So you can't do that. So the, the body is not like um, a machine that you can just store elements in because it's everything you do is a continuous process, right? So you have to maintain a continual supply of elements if you want to retain a continuum of the processes that happen within your body. So if you drink water, for example, and salt, so you hydrate, uh, but a huge amount, you literally kick yourself out of electrolyte balance because there's a limited amount of potassium available. And if you're familiar with the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in the body, which is the kidneys basically um, balancing the osmolality of your uh, electrolyte. And osmolality is the, the density of the nutrients in, in your blood and, or electrolyte. 
And uh, its job is to dump whatever extra you get in there. So if you suddenly drink a whole lot of water with a lot of salt, um, all at once, and you don't at the same time also incorporate a whole lot of potassium in your meals at the, at the same time, it's going to be dumped or it's going to go into your place where it shouldn't be going into. And we talked last time about the fact that if you don't get your body enough water all the time, the regular basis, it's going to try to hold on to it. This is not any different from people who don't eat enough. And so what's going to happen? Their metabolism is going to slow and their body is going to try to make as much as possible out of the little food they eat. So they may reach the point of eating a single grape and end up gaining weight from it because in metabolic, I mean, it's an extreme, but I think it gets the point through the same thing with water. I don't see why it would be any different. So it will change how the, the body is going to process what you take in based on how you take it in, what size you're taking in and how often. And while I know that there are a lot of animals out there like elephants and other mammals you can would go drinking once every two days or so, pile in a lot of water. There are uh, mammals that, for example, take salt once a year. Fine. We are not them. <laughs> we need to sort of understand our limitations. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting how you mentioned last time that, you know, we are in such a sensory rich, uh, stimulating environment all the time, you know, and we're processing so much information and data constantly that our, you know, we require more sodium for just our cellular processes, you know, because of that. And it, it's really, really interesting because, um, you know, op ideally we want to have optimal health and be thriving and feeling good and sometimes you wonder like why does it have to be so you know complicated um the more you gain health and sort of go keto low carb uh carnivore you would think like it should just kind of be simpler and it should just get simpler and simpler as you know but sometimes it seems like it gets more complicated just to right and, and you know i think it boils down to uh many people ask me or tell me who are on a carnivore in particular, that while well, we should not be forcing drinking water and taking salt because, well, a million years ago when we ate only as carnivores, we didn't have the salt and the water every day. But we also didn't have uh, apartment buildings with elevators and cars honking on the street everywhere and all the noise and the pollution. So we have to put everything into context. So while we're trying to return in an ancestral way of eating, which is perfect, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we haven't been able to reset our environment to be ancestral as well. And um, I think we discussed this last time that, that when you go on a vacation where you have no internet, no television, no radio, no uh, cars on the road, and no light uh, perhaps either. So you really are in nature in terms of our ancestry type of nature. If you're there, ate an ancestral food, you probably would not need that much salt, that much water, or you may be able to address things differently because your brain is not stimulated. So we have to look to see what our environment actually causes. Yes, we are the same humans and we have the same two feet and same two arms, but our brain is stimulated continuously. And so this will have a different outcome. We have to adjust. So it it's cannot so, be easy. It makes sense. So the biggest mistakes that you see kind of with people mishandling their electrolyte supplementation in this low carb, like, you know, carb restriction space is really doing one meal a day and then also hydrating and sort of hydrating also one time a day. Or even if it's just two or three times. So what, what uh, really would be ideal is to hydrate as your body requires to be hydrated. So th there's really no need for you to drink uh, more than a glass of water. And a glass, you know, that too is arbitrary. You don't actually know how much water we really need in one sitting. But you definitely don't need to drink a liter or four glasses of water at once. There's just no need for that. And you wouldn't do that even in an ancestral situation if you had the chance or an access to water, right? So the only time you would do that if you didn't have access to water 
then you're going to pile up when you finally do. And if you did that today, it would not be a big problem if you did that like once, you know, blue moon, you did that, or like eating OMAD. Um, I live in an earthquake territory, so I can have an earthquake anytime. And if I do, I may be forced to eat OMAD um, for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, because I will not have any other chance. And that's totally fine. It's an emergency solution. But it doesn't mean that I need to force myself to be in that position which is not beneficial, generally speaking, on the long run, under the current environment. So once you put it into context, it sort of kind of changes. Yeah, I mean, I I like OMAD for, you know, convenience, like you were just saying, Um, but I just find it really challenging to get in enough nutrition at that meal without overloading your body, you know, and wanting to go into a, you know, food coma after. (laughs) Well, and beside the food coma, um, I I heard you discuss uh, on one of your podcasts with somebody, um, one of my processes that I use in my group, which is really, it's not read in any literature. It was very specific to my group that I use. um, I don't know if you're familiar with Kraft, uh, who used the the five-hour blood glucose and and insulin test, postprandial test on all his patients. You told me about it, um, and I think I brought it up with Dr. Ben Bigman because I was... Yes. Bigman, uh, there's somebody, uh, one of the, uh, I think, Stuart. I'm not quite sure which I don't, I don't remember. But um, um, basically what this test allows me to do is check to see what happens with people who eat OMAD. And it's really funny because I have one of the members who joined me from uh, after watching the video with us uh, just ran her five-hour a couple of days ago. Uh-huh. And um, so the five hour postprandial is basically, particularly in your OMAD, uh, they should be taking a fasting blood glucose whenever you wake. So that's independent from eating. Because when you eat OMAD, you may not eat until the evening. So that doesn't matter. Uh, so you take a fasting reading in the morning when you wake, when you had about 10 or 12 hours fasted. And then you don't take another blood measure until right before you eat. And that's an important measure because I can see how much your blood glucose may change from your process of cooking because you also get stimulated by the food as it is cooking, by the smell and the vision and so right. forth. And then uh, you start, after you ate, 30 minutes after that, uh, they take their blood glucose and blood, blood ketones every 30 minutes. And some people now have continuous glucose monitors and I'm getting mine, yay. That was my birthday gift that's coming pretty soon. Right. Um, but so this person didn't have it, so she checked every half an hour. Uh, and it was very interesting to see what happened. So let me just describe approximately. She forgot to take the fasting blood glucose, so it's just a pre-meal and then the meal, and then a past for five hours post the meal every 30 minutes. So, um, and I'm giving you the measurements in milligram per deciliter, which is mm-hmm. the American measure. So she took uh, both blood glucose, both ketones, and she uh, also used a GKI measure, which is a glucose to ketone uh, index, which has a lot of problems on it on their own. But so here's what happened. So she started out with a low normal glucose. So 76 was her starting glucose before her meal. And then she ate. And uh, it took her about an hour to eat. She ate approximately 150 gram protein in one sitting. And then she started measuring. So it's, that's a lot. Okay, I don't know how big she is into the height, activity, whatever. So it may just be not even. Um, I mean, just to qualify that, like if you look at a standard bodybuilder, like that would be their like intake for the whole day, right? So is that is right. that OMAD? It, this was OMAD. And she could very well be a bodybuilder. I have a lot of athletes in there, so okay. I, I don't know. So we, uh, we don't really look to see. Um, I thought this was just breakfast, so I was like, wow. No, no, no. This was a person who, was, who ate OMAD, and so okay. this was actually her one meal, and that was at dinner time. Oh. And so she didn't eat the whole day. And um, so her pre-meal, it was like 5 p.m. or something, was 76. and then. Um, the, the first next reading was uh, half an hour after she ate, and uh, which was still normal. It was, it was in the 80. It just jumped a little bit. Normally, I see a pretty flat line, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, as we talked before. But then what happened? 
two hours. Now, mind you, we talked about protein synthesis, which starts at about four hours after you ate the meal. So protein synthesis itself is a four to eight hour process. Uh, but at about two hours, your stomach pretty much empties as much as it can. So if you have good stomach acid, about two hours after you finish eating, you should have most of your food out of your stomach and enters into the metabolic phase. And so right at that time, she had a blood glucose spike that was big enough to qualify for eating ice cream, a nearly 20 point spike. And in, in millimole, that's 1.1 millimole per deciliter spike, which is a huge spike. And normally in, uh, for migraineurs, a so 20 point spike, even in the protocol standard, which is just low carb high fat, if you're spiked 20 points, I don't want you to eat that food. That's just that. I don't want you to, to go that high. So she spiked to, um, she actually spiked more than that. She went to 108 overall. So from pre-meal, and then she had whatever, 80 something, and then she went to 108. So from 76 to 108, that's a 32 point spike in the course of just this one meal in the two hours. Isn't that 42? No, 32. It's 32 from 70 to 100. It's 30. And then yeah. from 76 to 108, so 32. 32. It doesn't matter what. It's larger than 20, it, no matter what you look at it. So when you're looking at the goal of eating only protein, particularly for somebody who wants to uh, control blood glucose and insulin, is to not have such a huge blood glucose spike. But okay, so she added then up to 108. Fine. So she obviously overextended her um, ability to synthesize, and that's something that we're going to talk about. So much of the protein that she consumed converted into glucose in a very unlikely fashion. But then what happened afterwards is what was the problem, is that she ended up with a crash to 72. So she went to lower than what it was before. Now, because it was over five hours, it doesn't count as reactive hypoglycemia. But if I'm looking at the curve, if it's like straight up and down, it clearly indicated a reactive hypoglycemia, as you should have continued, because technically we have the rule that if your last reading is the lowest measure, you need to continue. We need to see an uptick in a glucose to be sure we know you're not heading toward a sugar crash. So I had no way to exclude that she was heading toward an actual sugar crash. And so you can see that such a huge change in her blood glucose happens because of insulin that was activated. Now, protein does activate insulin, we know that, but not to this degree. Not so, at all, carb, yeah. Not at all. And so there was also the problem of ketones. When you're on the carnivore diet, normally, as we all know, you're not very high with your ketones, it's, it's pretty normal low. And, and for migraineurs, I don't even like high ketones because they tend to cause problems. Um, her ketones started out, I believe it was two millimole, which was a normal high. It's on a higher end for what I prefer. And um, I think it went to like three and then it went back down to like one. Um, and then, and then uh, the most important part of this is that when you are in st strong ketosis, like she is in a stable ketosis, when insulin is released, what happens to your ketones? They back up because there's a little bit of a difference. And it's, this is never, ever discussed, but it, it is my hypothesis because this is, I keep on seeing this and this is my only explanation that I could come up with is that there's a little signal delay. So when you eat something that initiates insulin, um, you immediately stop using ketones because insulin has released, but yeah. you haven't yet stopped making it. So there's a little signal difference. And so, and also in your cells, the mitochondria that use ketones versus use glucose, they don't use ketones or glucose, they use acetyl uh, uh, coenzyme. So, uh, it's, you know, some mitochondria may be taking its last bite of glucose and it's starting its ketones in, in uh, the coenzyme that it's getting, but, and also within a cell, maybe hundreds of thousands of mitochondria, and not all will start at the same time. So it's a process again, it's not like cut and now we're gonna do ketones and you know, cut, now we're gonna do glucose. So it's a process. And what I see is that when 
insulin releases, ketones actually increase in the blood. And that fools the G GKI, which is a glucose ketones index, because actually what happens is at that point, your ketones increase because you're not using them. You're burning glucose. So the increased ketones doesn't mean you're in a deeper ketosis. You're actually in a lesser ketosis. And so many people are misled when they're eating OMAD, thinking that, oh, well, it's good. I'm maintaining status quo and it's very healthy for me. And it's not. It's really not good. And so, so if you're looking at these blood tests as well, you can clearly see that how it's affecting your blood glucose, it is actually causing problems. So where you're saying that you want to get rid of, it's causing it. And so, um, but if I'm comparing it to other people who are not eating OMAD, um, but they, I'm doing the same blood test for every single person who joins my group will do this five hour test um, in time. And we monitor this for their health. Uh, are they becoming less insulin resistant or uh, is the food type that they eat good for them? It isn't necessarily standardized that um, a carnivore diet, for example, is good for everyone equally well. And so there's some huge variations that this can lead to. Yeah, I mean, I think having a meal that large in one sitting, um, you know, you're obviously you're going to err on the side of triggering right. the protein synthesis, but then it's a lot of, of food for the body to break down. Um, I'm curious, just as a quick follow-up, if it would have anything to do with, um, I know that if protein only is consumed, that the liver will release glucagon, which will send blood glucose higher, um, okay. but it probably was a mixed meal. No, this was actually just protein, so she's on It would probably have some fat in it, unless it was oh, yeah, yeah. Like whey and <laughs> egg whites, right? Right. Right. So you have fat. I mean, obviously, few of us have access to eating pure protein. And um, yeah, you could have rabbits, but even rabbits have some fat. I mean, you just really uh, can't have pure protein. You can if you're having whey. Whey and uh, whey. <laughs> Right. But I think that even in, in the case of whey, I mean, you have to put it into something to make it edible. I mean, I have been known to lick whey, you know, because I actually like the taste of it. But um, it's not necessarily desirable that way. So you always eat a mixed meal. But now that we talked about the glucose, because we talked so much about protein synthesis, and um, I have been thinking a, a lot about this because I disagree with a lot of people in concept of a protein synthesis and um, things turning to glucose versus not. And so I sent you a, a table that I wanted to, to cover a little bit, and I also took some notes here, so let me go to my notes, because um, I wanted to, to explain a few things. So if you're looking at that table, I... Just to set the context for our listeners, the whole reason we were talking about this chart is to talk about what happens to protein when we eat it um, in right. the body in this never-ending debate about gluconeogenesis. So Angela and I were, you know, trying to synthesize... On this show, I'm always trying to get different, you know, opinions on what happens to the protein that we eat. Um, you know, does it turn into biologically useful material? How much of it turns into glucose? What environment context does the body turn it into glucose? Does it even get used as, you know, fuel? And uh, we were messaging about that. So, you know, looking at Dr. Ben Bigman's work, contrasting it with some protein scientists like Dr. Don Lehman, Dr. Stu Phillips, what are you know some of the conclusions that you've come to? In that table, I I'll, put it, I'll put it on the screen for anyone who is watching the podcast. So if you're listening to it, you can head over to YouTube to watch perfect. the video to see the chart. Okay, it's perfect. So, so on this chart, I actually compared, basically took ribeye because everybody's familiar with ribeye. And I took that as the standard to which I compared other things. And here I just took out three typical things that uh, migraineurs will, four actually, sorry, that migraineurs will, will eat. So the ribeye is one, chuck, which is another form of steak that all, or beef that a lot of people choose, drumsticks and, and um, uh, wings of chicken, which is also a very common food for a lot of people in carnivore as well as in keto and, and then milk. a lot of times is in is like ground beef 
similar? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't take the ground beef. A ground beef is similar actually to, yeah. it depends on the mix. Yeah. Because, um, and also probably country specific because I will buy chuck that I grind up at home. So my ground meat is actually chuck. But if you buy ground meat in the store that is pre-cut and pre-ground, then you're getting something completely else. It's going to be mixed meat and it's going to have a uh, different quality protein in it, depending upon what mixes are in it. So we can't really be sure in ground meat. So I didn't incorporate it because that's a good guess all the time and we had no idea. Um, and I put in milk just to point something out. I know that a lot of people don't drink milk, but uh, migrants do. And 99% of us are drink milk and I drink milk and, and eat cheese. And I thought that it's a good example to point out when we're talking about, for example, how much protein you need to have for synthesis, uh, what actually starts your synthesis, and uh, how much and what the rest will convert into. So when I'm taking uh, ribeye, I'm taking that as a standard. It's not quite 30 gram. I looked at 100 grams, sorry, not quite 30 gram protein, but I looked at 100 grams. So everything across the board initially was 100 grams. And I took 100 gram um, of uh, ribeye, and that one had 29.5 gram protein. So that's close enough to the 30 magic number that everybody thinks it should be. Then I took 100 gram chuck, 100 gram of the chicken, uh, again, just the dark meat, drumsticks and, and wings, um, and, uh, and milk, so 100 grams. So 100 gram is 3.5 ounces for those of us in the US. And then I looked at how much protein in each. So in the ribeye, 100 grams is 29.5 grams. So just about meeting what we think is the leucine threshold. And for those not knowing what that means, is that the leucine threshold is a level at which we believe protein synthesis starts. And of course, this is age and activity de dependent. So the older you are, the higher this number gets, and the less active you are, the higher this number gets. And so yeah. if you're... Sorry. Yeah. Go on. I'm just going to say that number specifically comes from being able to get these amounts of leucine, right? Like that's where that number comes from. Right. Right, which in this case is uh, 2.5 uh, uh, two seven. So it is assumed that 2.57 or 2.5 to 3 grams of leucine is sufficient for most people to start uh, protein synthesis. And what this means is that this is how much leucine has to hit the blood in a bolus amount. So it's not a summation of many different meals, but in, in at once. So if you're, I think it was Dr. Lehman who said that if your um, uh, leucine improves, uh, increases threefold in your blood relative to what it was before, then protein synthesis will start. So that makes a lot of sense. It isn't necessarily true for everyone because of the age and activity dependence. So a person who is very young, may not even need to meet this 2.5 threshold and may uh, start protein synthesis from anything. But a person who is over 40 may need more than three. 2.5 is probably not even near to being enough unless the person eats right after a uh, high uh, intensity ex you know, uh, training exercise. So again, there are variables. And so it isn't a set number. But somewhere between 2.5 and 3 grams of leucine is a requirement. So I'm basically looking at this table, and I'm looking at leucine, and looking at the protein. So all these food elements that I picked was to, to see, will the 30, first of all, will the 100 gram of each of these meals give me the 30 gram protein? And will the 30 gram protein give me the 2.5 to 3 grams of leucine equivalently? And it clearly doesn't. So for those who can't see it, um, the 30 grams of ribeye had the 25, uh, 2.5 uh, gram leucine, but chuck was 2.4, so it was a little bit less. Mm -hmm. uh, drum, drumstick, 1.6. That's surprising. That's surprisingly low. Because chicken yeah. is usually pretty high in protein. Chicken but is, that is believed to be pretty high in protein. And, but it actually isn't. And that was a very interesting observation. And milk is actually 2.7. So just so that you know, so milk is, is, is pretty high. Uh, so this is actually once I... Mean it says three even. Well, so in the milk, if, if you're looking at it, so all of these are not corrected, like I said, for the 30, for the 30 gram protein equivalent. 
So milk is a richest. So then I ordered this whole thing. So which food would you pick first to eat if you wanted to start protein synthesis? And based on this, if you look at it, the highlighted milk. So the order of preference would be for leucine alone, milk, then ribeye, then chuck, and then drumsticks. And, but in some cases, for like methionine, the choice is chuck. In um, the case of cysteine and uh, uh, histidine and uh, aspartic acid, um, it would be ribeye, but only for four elements. So, so as you can see, the most elements within amino acids, if, you, if you're looking at to complete an amino acid profile in a large quantity in our for your health, milk happens to be actually the richest food. And it makes sense because if you consider babies who are suckling on milk, they're not suckling on ribeye. So there's a reason for the milk being so good. Yes. Um, so milk appears to be the best. Of course, you have to take a lot more of it. And I calculated that out as well, which is not included for you. But um, all of this will be in a book that I'm working on. So I, I haven't uh, included everything. But for example, to compare how much you would have to eat of each of these foods, um, and I also added salmon and, and some other things here, in order to, to get uh, the right amount, of the, 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 um, the 30 protein gram equivalent, such that you are also meeting the um, uh, leucine threshold, you would have to eat uh, 135 gram chuck, which is bigger than 100. So it's a third more than what you would have to eat from a ribeye, which could be important when you're OMAD. You would have to eat right. some more food. That is a very big difference. Uh, you'd have to eat three or three times as much chicken to get that in drumsticks and, and wings. And, and I believe the wings are categorized as white meat because uh, chickens are not flying birds, but technically we call that a dark meat. And then in milk, it's 909 grams, which is almost a liter. So we're talking about four cups of milk. And it may appear like a lot, but believe it or not, I used to be drinking that much a few years ago. And I have right now, uh, uh, at least one migrainer who was in India who drinks that much. It makes me feel a lot better about all the milk I used to drink when I was a teenager. <laughs> That's right. And I'm still drinking all the time. And it's good for you. I mean, it yeah. may not be good for everyone. Can't say it in general, can't generalize. But for those of us who are not lactose intolerant and not sensitive to, to whey, milk is a fantastic food. It also has yeah. very good fatty acids, short chain fatty acids that don't exist in others. So it's, it's a very rich, and the number of amino acids that are found in the highest amount, um, if I had to order overall these foods, milk came out that 11 of the amino acids out of the 20 were in the highest amount. And which may or may not be good, depending upon which amino acids like glutamate may not be the best. The second was ribeye, the third was drumstick, and the last one was chuck. So there's some surprising, surprising it findings here. It makes me wonder because at the end of my meal, I always have some uh, Icelandic yogurt. And I wonder if like I get a craving for it. I always thought it was the tartness because of the short chain fatty acids and you know microbiome but i wonder if it's a protein like we're like we're almost there you know just just it give us a little be. bit of milk because it, it's it made could be from. both it could be both and it also has an additional short chain uh, that's just a medium chain actually 15 an odd chain fatty acid that is only found in milk and nothing else so it's supposedly it's extremely healthy so i'm not sure it's in all milk it depends on the hypospecialized whatever yeah, i was gonna yeah. ask is it like what kind of milk did you use in your chart because the one like I do, Icelandic yogurt is made from skim milk, but I also do a lot of kefir um, and kefir cork uh, cheese and that. So I wonder if it's, does it matter what kind of milk? Uh, I look at what it, the American standard whole milk, which has milk. only 3.25, but it, it's not really whole milk relative to European whole milk because <laughs> right. like, European whole milk has more fat than the it's American like whole milk. <laughs> It's still controlled, so it's unfortunately uh, it's still reduced. It's three point two five percent, but it is whole milk, and it's not raw. If I get raw, I, I couldn't get the information on the raw with all the the uh, protein uh, amino acids. So that's another problem. Limited in the USDA database of what I can get the amino acid profile. And then again, the amino acids may vary based on whether it's organic, not organic, uh, how the animal. 
uh, was handled. Uh, so I'm just using care, whatever standard was in the USDA. So it's by no means any law. But it is also important, I, I mentioned that I looked also at fish. And salmon is a very common food for carnivores as well as uh, the yeah. ketogenic diet because it's very high in potassium. Um, but salmon um, has, uh, it says, uh, but I noted here, it tends to have less protein um, depending on where you get it from. So salmon is high in protein, it's almost equivalent to ribeye if it is well cut and Pacific. Mm. If it's from the Atlantic or if it's a farm, it's going to be way less. So That's the kind I only have because I'm a BC girl. <laughs> Gotta have and, a and even there, You can have like the coho and uh, there are whole kinds of, and all of them are different. So you really yeah. need to look every single one. If you really truly want to understand what you're doing, you need to really look up every single kind of animal, every single kind of protein and understand what you're eating, which I used to do. And I still do. I use one of these uh, food um, chronometer that, that allows me to check yes. and it gives you the details for many of the foods as long as you don't pick a brand name food. I'm um, curious if you looked at eggs at all. I, you know I didn't look at eggs in this one uh, I forgot about it I could have looked at eggs. Um, I find eggs are everybody calls it the perfect food and yeah. eggs are in fact the perfect food because they're packaged easy to carry and so forth but egg white is so glucogenic and I guess we're going to yeah. talk about that too. Yeah. I, I, and it also, um, I know it's like a histamine, um, trigger or it, it, it's not necessarily it high in histamine, but it can activate, um, that for right. too. So that's really interesting. So the whole reason, just to set the context for our listeners, the whole reason we were talking about this chart is to talk about what happens to protein when we eat it. Um, in right. the body in this never ending debate about gluconeogenesis. So Angela and I were, you know, trying to synthesize on this show, I'm always trying to get different, you know, opinions on what happens to the protein that we eat. Um, you know, does it turn into biologically useful material? How much of it turns into glucose? What environment context does the body turn it into glucose? Does it even get used as, you know, fuel? And uh, we were messaging about that. So, you know, looking at Dr. Ben Bigman's work, contrasting it with some of protein scientists like Dr. Don Lehman, Dr. Stu Phillips, what are, you know, some of the conclusions that you've come to? Okay, so I've come to a little bit different conclusions from all of them. I agree by and large with Dr. Lehman. Um, I think that he gave the most uh, comprehensive response. Um, and I think that Ben Bigman is uh, an insulin expert. So we have to listen to what he has to say as well, because obviously protein and insulin interact. So we need to understand that aspect. Uh, I think that's a lot more important than, than the interaction with fat and, and carbs and so forth. But so it seems, uh, if I remember correctly, Dr. Lehman said that indeed 60% uh, of protein will turn to glucose. Uh, I think your question was, is if you eat 100 gram protein, will 60 gram of that turn to glucose? And so he said, yes. And so I did a little analysis. So he mentioned that you have 20 amino acids of which two are ketogenic and the rest of them are glucogenic. That's yeah. not quite correct. Because of the rest that are glucogenic, <clears throat> there are five that can be either ketogenic or glucogenic depending upon who you are. And so on that little chart that I sent to you, I use a color coding and I explained what was what. So if you're in ketosis, then those five that could switch sides will switch and potentially, we don't know, it depends on many situations, and may burn as, glucose, as ketones or they may burn as glucose. So then what I did, <clears throat> I looked at, um, the, the, for example, in the ribeye, we know precisely which ones had a glucogenic and a ketogenic, and I summed them up, we know exactly how many, Grams, uh, grams we have of each. And so um, of the variable glucogenic or ketogenic, we have 5.23 grams. Of the purely ketogenic, we have 5.26 grams. And um, in the glucogenic only, we have 19.1 grams. Okay. So when I'm looking at the sum and calculating the percent, if the ones that are variable turn to ketones, and not glucose, then 
64% will turn to glucose in the ribeye. If we are on a carbs diet and not in ketosis, and so the body isn't converting the ketones into fat, but uh, those variables are also turned to glucose, they're actually converting 82%, okay? But we're not using it as glucose. And I think this is what confuses everyone. So mm -hmm. let's go back to the mitochondria. And we talk, you talk to every single one of the, those persons about the citric acid cycle and, and the mitochondria getting the, the protein. We, we know that the mitochondria doesn't get glucose and it doesn't get ketones. It gets a C C a coenzyme, right? So mitochondria has no idea what it's getting. So the question is, what is going to get stuck at the pyruvate step, which is a step, um, a couple of steps removed before the food actually hits the mitochondria in acetyl uh, coenzyme form and uh, removed from being a glucose or um, a protein. And of course, fat, when we eat fat, it, it does not go through the pyruvate process. And even in protein, some proteins under some condition can bypass the pyruvate process. So when they bypass the pyruvate process and they enter the citric cycle somewhere else, then they're absolutely nothing to do with glucose, right? Because pyruvate is the one that converts the glucose into something else. The ones that uh, bypass the cycle, they may stay purely as glucose and head in as that, or they may be something completely different depending upon what part of the cycle they send into. But let's look at the ones that get stuck at the pyruvate process and convert. So at the, in the pyruvate process, two things are converted. Either glucose converts into pyruvate and lactate. Uh, uh, um, lactate is what it, is, it can also be converted to, or the protein can be convert, is converted into pyruvate and lactate. And so what is lactate? So lactate is when, um, the mitochondria says, my stomach is full, can't take more energy in, so hold the fuel. The pyruvate process cannot hold it. It has to pass it on to something else. So at that point, it will convert it to lactate. And so the lactate then will head back to the liver. So this is where we get into the liver. Um, and in the liver, the lactate has, can take one or three routes. It can either return back into the pyruvate process right away, depending upon I don't know what, because I'm not, that's not my uh, area of, of expertise. Or it can convert into glycogen, which will then be used as gluconeogenesis, and in fact, will become glucose uh, for the body as, as we need it. Or it can turn to triglycerides, which is a storage form, which is considered to be more permanent. And these, that, whichever it becomes will depend upon the amount of insulin available at the time. Interesting. Okay, so the higher insulin you have, the more likely it will be converted to triglycerides and stored because insulin is anabolic, right? So it's going to uh, convert it into that. It's not going to be converting it into glucose uh, via, the, uh, via glycogen because insulin and glycogen processes are uh, negatively impacted. So you have to blow insulin to produce glycogen, right? And then the, uh, the lactate, lactate can be used directly by certain organs like the brain. Uh, some of the parts of the brain can use lactate, which is a modified glucose, um, but not every organ like the red blood cells can't use lactate. So it's going to go back up either to be converted to pyruvate or go back up to be, again, uh, processes, triglycerides or glycogen. So not much of the protein, if you're looking at it this way, will actually convert to glucose. Because if you're, even though it can't convert to glucose, that, what that means is that it's going to convert to pyruvate. And so at that point, you need to decide, or the, the body will decide, well, what is going to be the role of this pyruvate? And so it's different from when you eat glucose, say uh, you eat an apple, and you bite into it, and the glucose hits your blood, right away, bypassing everything, and it just becomes glucose. That's not gonna happen in the case of protein. Something has to take that protein and convert it into glucose. It's yeah. not gonna happen without it. And so when we're looking at that, for example, in the case of, say you're on a carbohydrate metabolic process or glucose 
uh, that metab metabolic process are not in ketosis, then 80%, 82% of the protein will turn into glucose. It's not turning into glucose, it's turning into pyruvate. And then from pyruvate, it turns into whatever it needs to turn into based on what the body needs. And so this is why those people who use a continuous glucose monitor and are on the carnivore diet see a very flat line blood glucose because if it didn't happen this way if, if 64 to 82 percent of the glucose uh, 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 the amino acid that could convert to glucose convert to straight to glucose you would see a huge spike but you don't see that unless of course I stopped wearing i stopped wearing mine because it was never moving <laughs> it was just exactly and so we can talk about that too whether that's good or bad and that's a completely different story but it's not moving and it's a sign for you that it may be turning into pyruvate and it may be turning into triglycerides if you eat too much which then your body will later use because you're in ketosis right and so in the ketogenic diet what is your body using for fuel it's using triglycerides converted into ketones so basically it's a full circle right you're not actually converting and using it as glucose, even though those were glucogenic amino acids, but it converted to triglycerides, which then your body can use in a different way. So That's it, really uh, interesting because I did see one, one piece of research saying that actually carnivore diets were deepening ketosis. And I was like, that I don't know how that would be possible, but that yeah, that's interesting. It can. It, can. it depends on how you eat. And, and I have some uh, good... Um, reference material on that because in the group uh, for so many years we've been using carnivore uh, ketogenic diet and I have a variety of carnivore diets uh, depending upon the state of metabolic state of the person who is using it and so uh, we go different percents of protein to fat and uh, whether they can drink uh, or have dairy or not so we kind of sort of change things around and so we start from the low carb high fat to a very strict very high protein carnivore, which is higher than what is medically recommended. So we don't recommend it for a very long term, but it seems to bring people out of insulin resistance and diabetes in a safe way without sugar crashes. So at that point, uh, I use 70% protein by weight, which is very difficult to attain. It's only very lean meat and usually no cooking with butter or anything because that's too much fat. So, and it's usually not for a long time, it's for a few months. When I see that, okay, because otherwise, if you don't do that, they get sugar crashes left and right because much of that will convert to ketones. They're not ready for ketones. The body can't use the ketones when you're at such a high uh, insulin resistance. And I find this is specific to migraineurs, perhaps, but yeah. we're just extremely different from other people. And I focus on migraineurs, so my expertise will be different in this regard. But yes, yeah, so, so, so back to the point in terms of the gluconeogenesis, um, I disagree with it turning to glucose gluconeogenesis does happen. It always happens. It's a continuous process, whether you're um, carbs diet or uh, carnivore diet or whatever. It's a never ending process. We always use ketones because leucine, which is the rate limiting process for protein synthesis, and we all have muscle, has to be in, in, uh, done in a ketogenic uh, environment. It has no alternative. So everybody on this planet at some time is in ketosis there's just no other way and so we are trying to sort of separate ketosis from not ketosis but really again it's a continuous continuum it's not a cut and i am in ketosis now and no i'm not in ketosis now so there's just very big differences and i don't think that uh there is a reason to be that concerned about protein converting to glucose because you're not eating it. It's not the kind of food that can convert to glucose. It converts to pyruvate. And once it's converted to pyruvate, it's no longer glucose. So it was, it was never glucose to start with, and it's not glucose anymore. That's, that was going to be my question for you is, um, are people kind of substituting high protein diets for high carb? Yes. Uh, and so um, we have many vegans in the group, not necessarily migraineurs, but many vegans who plan to or are trying to switch over to a healthier way of being. And um, going carnivore is a very good way of doing that because 
first of all, they can then see what, what's the problem. So it's a perfect elimination diet. It removes all the problems that they may have. And it also allows them to switch off of carbohydrates without having to consume glucose. So with the gluconeogenesis that protein is capable of producing, uh, there is a continuous glucose supply. So if one has an unhealthy metabolism and they suddenly quit and they go to on to ketogenic diet where you still eat carbohydrates, the variability of glucose is still going to remain huge. So mm -hmm. I found, uh, at least in the case of migraineurs, they can't switch if they have type 2 diabetes or they have strong insulin resistance, prediabetes, they cannot switch to anything other than carnivore because in addition to getting sugar crashes, that is inevitable and their blood glucose can go down into the 50s. I mean, it's scary because at that time, they're not even making ketones yet. Or if they're making ketones, if they can go into starvation territory with the ketone making without using ketones. I had people who whose ketone, blood ketones went to seven or eight, and they were not using ketones yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I then asked them, okay, so do some exercise. Let's see what's happening and check again. And if they exercise, and the, the thing that actually reduces is glucose and not ketones, and you know they use glucose and not ketones. And so uh, this is also a measure to see whether they have to eat or not, because I don't have them eat when they have a glucose a, a sugar crash we exercise unless it goes really low or if from exercise it doesn't come up then they have to eat there's no alternative but they don't eat carbs they just eat protein so it's fine for them to to go to high protein diet then it's completely fine because the moment they go to high protein diet if they feel that they have a little bit of a low blood sugar as a result of your, their body's inability yet to adjust um because they're uh, so basically um, the body is just able to work with glucose. And at that point, gluconeogenesis is just releasing continuously. And so you can see, and this is well understood that one of the biggest problems and why people take metformin when they have type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance is because it reduces gluconeogenesis. So that's, well, it's not a healthy thing to do because the glucose is still building up in your liver, but at least it reduces the amount of glucose hitting the system continuously. So right. one sign is a continuous need for the glu gluconeogenesis um, that at the very beginning, if they're on a high protein diet is provided. And so that can get them over the hump so to speak, because they're no longer eating anything to spike insulin. And so they will still have glucose issues because they have high insulin, um, what I would call the reactive insulin, because they may have completely normal fasting insulin. Many of them com have completely normal fasting insulin. But the moment they eat one bite, boy, it flies sky high. So it's a reactive insulin. And so they have to tame that part. So when you eat only uh, protein, there's no reactive insulin unless of course you do OMAD <laughs> you have this right. big reaction that we talked about earlier but for a regular um protein eater in carnivore there is no such so it is a very good way to to re reverse and also you know some people say well you can just fast and and I suppose a lot of people can my goodness can't fast right off because right. that is also an electrolyte problem so back into the electrolyte discussion. So you, so you need to drink a lot more water and take a lot more salt when you're fasting, particularly for the first few times, because your body is going to get rid of so much insulin and that's going to get rid of so much salt and so much water because insulin normally holds onto sodium and, and water that when you're reducing your insulin, everything is going to go and you need to replace it. So a lot of people complain about being dizzy, being weak, headaches, so forth, well, those are all electrolyte issues. So just increase water and salt, and it's going to help. I'm glad we circled back to this because I was telling you in the messages that I get the same question answered quite often about women who do fasting, and then they go back on like carnivore, keto, very, very strict keto, usually keto carnivore, um, and then they get all of this edema which we started off talking about right um, and I wasn't sure if it's 
you know, I know we talked about the ratios before, but it almost seems like it's more related to just the changes of, you know, say they're fasting and they're not like keeping up salt as much as possible. Then they go back to eating and then there's sodium in the food and they're adding salt on top. And so it's like the difference of barely any to tons overnight that would cause that. Right. It it can. And also because don't forget, there's a a little organ in the middle of this that has to be able to adjust, which is your kidneys. And so kidneys are probably the oldest organ that there is that most mammals and animals, I think just about all animal kingdom animals have some form of kidney. So when you're looking at the kidneys, it was established quite a few millions of years ago, and it, and it has created a process that it works for it. And it uh, has a lot of functions that actually operates our entire metabolic system. It, it operates our entire uh, heart rate, blood pressure, you name it, it operates everything. And so when you make a single change of, hey, I'm not going to eat salt today. Well, okay, what is that going to do to your kidneys? So you have to consider all steps in the way of your metabolism. It isn't a, a tool that you can just not turn off and turn back on. It, it's a continuous state of functioning in some status. And then if you make a change in one, it's going to affect all the others. And so, for example, if you were, just give you an example here, if you were vegan or vegetarian who mostly ate plants and you suddenly switch to a mostly meat-based diet, you will have an entire month at least for your kidneys just to get used to the fact that now you're going to have to uh, collect the water and sodium and potassium from completely different sources and also, the amount that is going to be provided is going to be different, but the kidney has, has to maintain the same osmolality at all times. And so if at one time you suddenly take a huge uh, salty meal, it's not going to last you for the next two hours. It's going to be dumped by your kidneys within half an hour. Um, the blood circulates through the kidneys filtered, I believe, five times per hour, something like that. And so when you suddenly eat a meal full of sodium, and if it was too much, it's going to dump most of it within 20 minutes, right? So if it dumps sodium, it will also dump water. So you're going to end up dehydrated. And so it's going to have to, you have to adjust to these in a, in a way that your kidney can adjust to the osmolality. You can make changes overall. Uh, the goal is to increase the blood volume to a healthy level. Uh, But there are other factors. So, for example, a lot of people will have, say, well, I had increased blood pressure the moment I take salt. I had some some people who complained on the previous video, well, I can't take salt because my blood pressure increases. Mm -hmm. And there can be, there is rare, um, not very common to have salt-sensitive hypertension, so it can happen. But I've had people who have joined the group, I think I had like two or three so far, who had diagnosed salt sensitive hypertension and the moment they stop eating carbs guess what yeah no longer there okay so things are highly variable Mm -hmm. but we need to always look at our environment and so another thing to consider is what does protein do in terms of salt and water in the body so there are two different views that we can look at protein in order for its digestion, it's a very nutrient dense product. And so it's going to increase osmolality tremendously uh, as it goes through your body. So one of the first things that it's going to have to do is retain salt and water in order to sort of keep the checks and balances so that when you urinate after eating a steak, you're not going to urinate out all of your excess amino acids because the osmolality is kind of out of whack. So it's going to retain sodium and water. And so when you eat a huge amount of OMAD and then you drink salt and water, well, all of that is going to be retained. And then where is it going to be retained at? You don't have a storage form for salt and water other than whatever the cells, the interstitial space around the cells because these are not necessarily in the cells. And of course we are 60-70% 60-70% water, so we have water continuously moving in and out of everything, but not salt. Salt has to go through electrical uh, gates and pumps. So where are they going to go? It's not going to stay in the blood. 
where is it going to go? It's going to go to edema. So there you have a problem also in how much you drink, how often you drink it, and after what you're drinking. Uh, so there are little factors to always consider. So those who complain about having to add salt or water causing edema, they need to change how they add the salt and water. It isn't necessarily the amount they're adding, but it's how they're adding it and with what food. So those on the ketogenic diet, for example, they don't eat a lot of carbs. But if you, for example, eat only one meal a day on the ketogenic diet, which you, you can do, and you eat, uh, say, 20 carb grams in that meal uh, all at once, which again, you can easily do, and then you drink a glass of water with salt, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Carbs, as they turn to glucose, when the glucose enters the cells, it kicks out sodium and water. So all that sodium and water is kicked out by glucose, and it's going to end up as edema. This is something that we work with um, with the migraineurs all the time of how to actually eat carbs. So mm -hmm. no drinking water and no eating salt during the carbohydrate eating. So there so are some... The same thing be applied then to carnivore? Uh, so this is a question. If you're an OMAD and you eat a huge amount of meat at once, and you can see this huge glucose spike because your liver is dumping um, glycogen. Glycogen is glucose. It's just a larger gene. It's a starch equivalent, right? And then it hits your blood and enters the cells. The blood and the cells, it's glucose. It doesn't know where it came from. It's still glucose. So if you end up with a very large increase of glucose in your blood, then you better not eat any salt and water at the same time because that's just going to be dumped into edema. But so if they wait, they salt their food, but just don't also add it to water at the same time. If they, or don't drink water with it. So if you eat OMAD, if you insist upon eating OMAD and you eat so much protein that you definitely will have the sugar uh, blood glucose spike after eating it, then um, if you salt, you salt your food to taste, it's perfectly fine but don't drink water with it or in immediately after because it's going to retain it. It wants to retain it. And if you oversalted and you didn't drink, you're going to urinate out the excess salt and it's going to dehydrate you. And then you can drink salt and water after. So to kind of, that's what we do uh, you know, with my gang group is that after you ate a meal that had a lot of glucose, be it high protein or be it actually carbohydrates, uh, you don't drink uh, water at all for about 30 minutes after eating and you right. don't drink water with it because it's just going to empty. You're just going to run to the toilet anyway. And uh, we don't even salt the food, but if you salt the food, you're going to urinate it out without exception. It's, it's amazing. That's, that's really helpful because I get that question a lot, but I think anyone who has more questions for you about these topics should absolutely join your groups uh, where can everyone join your Facebook groups to find out more and ask you more questions themselves directly? Yeah, I don't even I don't even remember the name of my groups. Let me let me tell you. Let me look at that. Well, they added. I just no. I, I just joined them, so I know you have the Stanton protocol. Right. So there are two. So one of them is the migraine sufferers who want to be cured by the Stanton migraine protocol. The Stanton migraine protocol is in both names. That was a Facebook recommendation for copyright. And the second one is a Stanton ketogenic protocol for migraine. So these are the two. But if people search for, for me by name, uh, put a PhD after that because Angela Stanton is an extremely common name. So put Angela A. Stanton PhD and then you're going to get all my, I have all kinds of blogs and I have books and, and all kinds of other things to, to look into. And of course, I have previous videos with you and with others. There's a lot of other interviews and podcasts to listen to. And, and of course, join the group. That's the best way to come and I know that's where you just join and I'm looking forward to yeah. see some of the answers and some of the blood tests in particular you can check the blood tests because they're in the group they're not public but they're in the group so you can see them well I'm so glad that you have these groups because it seems like people have endless questions about electrolytes right. and you know hopefully we can start to understand more of how to do this properly because we're all just learning you know it's None of us have really done some of these diets. They haven't really been studied long term. Right. Um, we're still figuring a lot of this stuff out together. So it'll be great to to have that resource. So thank you so much for coming back on. I feel like I could talk to you for hours if I didn't have to go do a, a live uh, Instagram thing. But 
Um, I really appreciate you taking the time again to come on and thank and you. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed indulge talking me. to you. <laughs> indulge all my questions. Um, and I know people will have tons of questions for you under the video again, like they did last time. So it's really nice of you to take the time to answer people because, um, yeah, they really are looking for advice. And then one thing that would be important is I am much more active on YouTube and Facebook than on, uh, um, Instagram. So I'm not really active right. that much on Instagram. So if they have questions, they should add. And also I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at my game book. So if they have questions, I will respond much faster on Twitter and on Facebook and on YouTube than I would on Instagram. Yeah, I'll put I'll put links um, to the groups to the two different groups too in the show notes here. So thank if you. you're looking for them, just click below. But thank you so much for coming on again and thank you. your time and expertise. Thank you. Have a super day. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode today. If you think this episode could benefit someone else, be sure to send it and share it with them. Hit the like button on your way out. I really appreciate the love. And uh, as I said, I'll put the link to Angela's Facebook groups here if you want to join. If you are interested in trying out keto with me, having me as your coach and guide, head over to ketogeniggirl.com. Check out all the programs that I have there. I have all meal plans, programs, and also VIP one-on-one -on -one coaching where we take a look individually at your goals and diet and do food tracking and all of that. So uh, that's all at ketogeniggirl.com. And until the next episode, wishing you a fat-fueled rest of your day. And thanks for watching.